Thanks for everyone for coming along to our webinar and thanks for the people that are tuning in and watching the recording. So today we're going to be answering a big question. We're going to be talking about celebrity endorsements and celebrity partnerships. Uh, they're, they're everywhere these days. It's almost uh, rare that a brand doesn't have some sort of celebrity partnership, but do they work? So in today's uh, webinar, we're going to talk about celebrity partnerships, gimmick or game changer. But Danielle with me here today. Thanks, John. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Wiseman. I'm the head of brand partners here at ProQuo AI, and I help brands solve their biggest strategic challenges. And I'm very excited to uh, explore this particular challenge of game changer or gimmick. Um, I'm John Curran. I'm the commercial director at ProQuo. So I'll be taking you through a little bit about our, our system as well as part of this. Uh, to kind of get us started, I'm going to explore the psychology behind celebrity endorsements uh, to kind of lay the groundwork for what we're about to share today. I'll get into how we understand celebrities, how we understand brands and why we feel confident answering this big question. And finally, we're going to take you through a live example of uh, a celebrity partnership to see in real time whether or not uh, uh, these types of partnerships are a worthy marketing investment. I'm excited to get started. Should we get into it? Let's do it. All righty. So. So we've done this talk a couple of times now, um, and we always kind of like to get a sense of whether or not people think that uh, these partnerships are worth it or not from a marketer's perspective. Is it something that they want to assign, you know, very valuable budget to uh, in order to achieve their, their marketing goals? And the vast consensus is that most marketers do believe um, that celebrity endorsements are a worthy marketing investment. And we've got some psychological evidence to back that up as well. Uh, researchers at Wharton University uh, definitely would agree with um, those of us that feel as though they are a worthy investment. Um, and in a recent paper that was published in 2023 on the marketing psychology behind celebrity endorsements, um, very smart professors in marketing psychology and neuroscience came to the conclusion that people are much more likely to choose a product that's endorsed by a celebrity, and they're much uh, faster to make that decision. It's a very, very quick and intuitive decision when there's a celebrity um, partnered with a, a product. It and the, the researchers are in the in the top picture, are they? Pardon me, what'd you say? The researchers are in the top picture. <laughs> yes. <laughs> field research at its finest. <laughs> um, what they found really interesting though, is that the power that celebs have to persuade our decision-making is really rooted in our biology and evolution. Hence that, um, that top photo. We see it um, you know, in the wild with primates. We also see it um, in our own wild society. Uh, people look to um, the to follow the lead of high status, high prestigious individuals in their group by aligning or copying their, their decisions and their behaviors. Um, this is an evolutionary um, tactic that you know, we've all evolved to um, for social cohesion. Um, and this is frequently observed, you know, playgrounds, high school hallways, sporting venues, professional institutions, every, everywhere you look, you can see people are looking to a high status individual to kind of understand how it is that they should behave in the decisions that they should make. And if you've been following this topic um, over the last decade or so, you may have come across this particular study um, done by Harvard. It was released in 2012, which is a very different time than uh, the world of 2024. Um, and what was interesting about the study is that they came to a fairly bold conclusion that by signing a high prof profile celebrity, and the example that they used was Tiger Woods, so it kind of gives you a sense of the era we're talking about, um, has the potential to deliver a 4% 4, 4 increase in sales um, and an additional uh, quarter of a percent in stock returns. That's incredibly compelling. However, there are many caveats to this study, um, kind of identifying all the different scenarios where you wouldn't necessarily get that return. Um, and also 2012 is a century ago in Adland years. So let's look for some more current evidence. 
And, you know, the um, most studied advertising event in, in our world, in our calendar, is the Super Bowl. And so looking at uh, stats from the Super, Super Bowl, there's our most compelling evidence that suggests that celebrity endorsements work is the sheer volume of partnerships that brands are entering into over the years. Um, we see that, you know, in the last year, uh, less than a third of all big game ads um, did not feature a celebrity. So that's two thirds of ads. They are becoming an increasing rarity to not have a celebrity featured in um, in an advertisement. Um, and with you know the cost and expense of um, you know advertising for the Super Bowl this year, the a thirty second spot went for seven million dollars, um, and more than three quarters of those ads featured one or more celebrities. Those are huge investments that brands are um, embarking on uh, in order to pr promote their brands. It feels like if you're going to invest that much money, you have to bring a celebrity along, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right fit or it's going to be impactful. That's just it. When you're up against that much of an investment, you're going to throw as much firepower at it as possible to make sure that you get a return on it. And it feels like a lot of brands are turning to celebrities for that firepower. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that while more brands are doing it and harnessing the power of celebrities, it's not necessarily translating into effectiveness. So our friends over at System One they have been um, tracking the effectiveness of every single Super Bowl ad for the last five years. And in 2024, they saw um, the least effective uh, kind of ratio of ads um, tested. So um, three quarters of those ads got a uh, three out of five or worse score um, out of the effectiveness model with the most one out of five um, ads ever recorded. So that's kind of <laughs> a bit nerve wracking. If we summarize that by going on to the next slide, you kind of get a sense of the world that we're living in right now. We're dealing with the most expensive advertising, um, the highest share of ads that are featuring celebrities and a five year low in effectiveness. Now that would make any marketer nervous. Um, but I'm going to pause there um, and kind of comment that what we're about to take you through is a global perspective of this, um, this scenario. Um, and while the foundation that we just built was very American leaning, it's very important, and we're going to demonstrate this shortly, um, that what works in America might not work in other parts of the world. And we're going to look at the UK in this in this um, example. It yeah. adds another layer of complexity um, to the mix, making things even more a little challenging for, for us marketers out there. Yeah, because right now this is not looking good um, for celebrity partnerships. So I think in summary that they don't guarantee effectiveness. Yeah, it's uh, it's not the biggest conclusion to make, but it is the most sound. You know, celebrity partnerships just simply do not guarantee that your marketing will be effective. Ineffective advertising is still ineffective advertising, and we're gonna kind of get a sense of like how what is what is the right recipe for including a celebrity? How do we make that ingredient really elevate uh, all of our work and deliver that ROI and effectiveness that we're all after? All right, well, we need some sort of brand study to base all of this work on. Um, before we get into that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about ProQuo and how we understand brands, how we can feel so confident, you know, uh, doing this sort of celebrity partnership engagement and this webinar and, and, and so on. So let me tell you a little bit about us, um, how we measure brands, how we understand partnerships with celebrities or, or, or test celebrities, so to speak, and how we can overlay all of that. So um, the first thing we do is measure the strength of the brand or, or how people feel about a brand overall. So um, our system, uh, every single day we interview consumers, we gather their feelings and their thoughts on brands, uh, categories, uh, uh, competition, and so on. Our AI analyzes all of that data and provides health metrics for all of the brands that we, we deal with. 
Um, so the first thing, if you want to know if a celebrity is going to have a, a positive impact on your brand, you have to know where your brand is. Right? So you need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of your brand. And for that, we have this framework. So using this framework, we can quickly and easily understand the emotional or rational strengths of a brand, the areas where it meets the requirements of the category, or maybe it doesn't. And understanding that, we can then just start marrying that up to a celebrity and saying, well, actually, if you have a, a brand that's kind of weak emotionally, then maybe you need a, a celebrity partnership that's going to strengthen that. So with our framework, what we do is we, we gather positive and, and negative sentiment, we measure consumers' feelings, and we map it across these 16 drivers. So if this is the sort of um, metrics and the measurement level, what's really cool is the way we're gathering this data. So at ProQuo, we use implicit response timing to time the engagement that the respondent has. So when we find the consumer who's a, um, a, a user or aware of the brand, we can understand how they actually feel about that brand. So top to bottom, how this works is we, we grab a um, whatever brand or category it might be, we qualify consumers into that. We gather all of the sort of uh, information you'd expect, right? So demographic information, awareness, and so on. Anyone that's aware of the brand, we then put those metrics in front of them and we time how quickly they engage with those questions. So they ever respond positively or negatively, so they agree or disagree. Unknown to them is that we're timing that engagement. If they respond within a calibrated time frame, we know that's a system one response, right? We're now capturing their feelings. If they respond outside of that, we know that system too. And that's valuable, but it's not what we're, we're looking for in, in this. The reason we're doing that and the reason we we um, do that at such scale is because we know that's the data that emulates consumer behavior. So the purpose of advertising is to drive engagement, is to change the way people feel about your brand so they'll engage with it. And that's really what we're measuring. So we understand how people feel about your brand. We can also tell you how they think about it as well. That comes later on. But that's sort of the data that we're going to be sharing today. And we do that for the brand and for whatever your asset might be. So whether that's a celebrity partnership or so on. And for today's talk, we did all of this for Sarah V. They had a really cool ad at the Super Bowl. So we thought we'd use them as an example and um, take you through that story. Why did we pick these guys, Danielle? Well, they are a leading brand, um, both in the UK and the US. Um, but also, I think because they launched a ad for the Super Bowl, we kind of wanted to tie it all together to get a sense yeah. of how that type of investment actually translated to brand equity uplift for the brand. Yeah, and it's a great ad as well. We're going to show it to you in a moment. So if we're going to understand if a celebrity partnership is right for CeraVe, we need to understand CeraVe. So a little bit more about our platform. Every single day we're inter interviewing consumers and gathering that system one data. You can see here in this example, at uh, the time of, of uh, compiling this, we were interviewing nearly 100 people a day. We had thousands of responses we can look at for, uh, for this example here. So this is a screenshot of our platform as I, as I take you through here. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is the overall brand equity. So that is a combination of all of those metrics you talked about, all of that rich system on data compiled together to give an overall health score. So it's looking pretty good for Sarah V. What, what are we looking at here, Daniel? Yeah. So, you know, if I was the brand manager for Sarah V, I'd be, you know, quite happy with my positioning in the market right now. They are leading the category at the moment. Not by a meaningful difference. Um, at ProQuo, our meaningful difference is a five-point metric on our ProQuo score. And so they're kind of neck and neck with the ordinary right now, but they are meaningfully outperforming that competitive average score. So we know they're very comfortably in that leading pack position, but that number one spot is a uh, bit tenuous right now. It's a bit up for grabs, it looks like. We need to look at this a, a couple of different ways then. Within our platform, you can actually segment the data and look at things like age, gender, and usership. And one of the things that we think it's important to look at is, is to segment through those. But also, because we're gathering the data every single day, we can start trending it. So let's see how CeraVe's data is trending over time. Um, it looks like it's fairly neck and neck at the top it's, there. It's, it's a tight horse race, isn't it? CeraVe is in the blue, um, and they were kind of neck and neck trailing a little bit behind the ordinary up until November where they overtook them again marginally and they're still managing to ride out on top but like I said that that number one spot it, it, it's anyone's um anyone's uh, position at the moment 
All right, brilliant. Well, let's start um, segmenting it. Let's look, look at some different views here. So we want to understand how people that are already engaging with their brand feel about them. So for that, we'll select users. And this is telling a bit of a different story. Slightly different story, exactly. If you're a leading brand, your user base and how um, the, the strength of your equity with your users is incredibly important. Um, larger brands tend to take up more of the market. And so if you have a bit of a leaky bucket and you're you know, constantly kind of losing customers um, because of your user experience, a competitor is offering something slightly more competitive, then you're really vulnerable to having your market share eroded. And we all know how expensive it is to, you know, acquire new customers and grow that market share in the first place. So being in that leading position, you really want to protect that hard fought market share and keep hold of your users. And right now, it looks like where CeraVe has some vulnerabilities in um, their strategy is on that user experience. They're less differentiated than two of the other leading brands in the category. So now the Inky list is um, in that top spot, followed by The Ordinary and CeraVe. But the point difference is nearly negligible. They're all performing at a very comparable level. So improving the brand's competitiveness with its users will certainly help protect its um, leading position and maybe carve out a little bit more um, space um, and take over that lead on the ordinary. And, and to see that, we need to understand what's making up this number, right? So we're looking at overall brand equity. It's a combination of those 16 metrics. So let's dive a little bit deeper. So what we're looking at now is what we call the Skittles chart. It's um, it's quite busy, but what you can see in the blue across the middle is CeraVe. And either side of them are the relative scores for all of the drivers for all of the competitive set. And the way that we uh, build this out is based on most expected to least expected from left to right. So when we're interviewing consumers and we're asking or gathering their feelings around brands, we're also asking them how they feel about the category. So what do they expect? What's important to them? And then looking at this, Daniel, what is this telling us about this category? Well, it's, it's showing that CeraVe is leading on those most expected drivers. And we, we tend to look at those most expected drivers as your table stakes, your hygiene factors. It's really what you need to be competitive on at par with the market in order to be in the consideration mix. And right now they are really, really strong on that, on that consideration factor. But you start to see where they trail behind a little bit, and that is down towards those lesser expected drivers, which, again, are not less important, just not as top of mind when a consumer is considering a particular category. Um, and those lesser expected drivers tend to be more on the emotional spectrum of our 16 drivers. Um, and... That seems to be where CeraVe is kind of lacking a little bit competitively, building its relationship with its users. That hasn't quite hit that more disruptive, more emotional um, experience just yet. Yeah. And, and CeraVe are a big brand. They've been around for a long time. It could be that they've sort of driven uh, category expectations. They're telling people Absolutely. what to expect a brand in this category to deliver on. Yeah. Now, we can also segment this uh, in all sorts of different ways. So, we're, we're sort of following that user thread of understanding how users feel about it. So let's select that again. And um, again, it's, it's it's telling a different story here. Yeah, it's definitely showing that that um, gap widens competitively for CeraVe. You start to see that really around those emotional drivers, um, particularly, you know, empathy, uh, popularity, aspiration, um, those drivers are, are where the brand really starts to fall behind. So we're starting to get an inside view as to where there might be some weaknesses and vulnerabilities in CeraVe's user base. And strategically speaking, that's what the brand would ideally be looking to address in order to elevate itself and um, really secure that leading position in the market. Okay, cool. So we've got an understanding of their overall brand health, how that breaks down across our 16 drivers. Um, so now they need to fix this, right? They need to partner with a celebrity to improve those emotional drivers or or improve that user experience. So we tested a few of the, the recent partnerships they did. We did quite a few um, different ones as well. CeraVe has been um, 
dabbling in different types of partnerships for a little while now, but recently they partnered with Marcus Rashford. Um, I think that partnership was launched in September of 2023. So pretty recently. Um, and that, you know, that collaboration helped CeraVe reach an additional 17.1 million of Marcus Rashford's IG followers. Then they tried something completely different by partnering with Michael Sarah, who does not have a social media presence at all, but is, you know, globally known for the most part, hopefully loved. Um, and then uh, they also are um, working with an influencer called Dr. Fab, who is uh, a dermatologist with a nice sized audience, 120,000 uh, IG followers. Um, and so we wanted to get a sense of how these three very different partnerships are impacting the brand, what um, they might be helping the brand uh, achieve that they couldn't achieve on their own. I mean, Marcus Rashford, amazing football player, massively loved in the UK for everything he did for like the, the lunches and, and things like that. That's got to be a winning partnership right there. <laughs> we will see. It has to be. <laughs> Um, all right, so the uh, the next step is to see this advert that they did with Michael Serra. So this is the Super Bowl advert. Let me just turn the sound on and make sure this is going to come through. I'm Michael Serra, and human skin is my passion, which is why I developed this. You didn't know? Can skin truly be this moisturized? Oh, yeah. Wow. Let my cream hydrate you. Three essential serum. Sarah V. Developed with Michael Sarah V. We like? So my name is Sarah. And so there's it's a perfect crossover opportunity. <laughs> All right. I'm Michael I, I love the ad. Yeah, I'm I, there we go. I, I think it's brilliant. <laughs> right. Um, but we need to find out if it actually has an impact on their brand, right? OK, so how do we test it? So we're getting back into our platform again inside the ProPro system. You can upload any asset you'd like and we'll uh, find out how consumers feel about that. We use exactly the same framework that we use to uh, measure the brands. So those same 16 uh, driver metrics. So you upload um, your assets into the platform. We put it in front of your category. We gather feedback from over 300 people um, and let's see what that looks like. So at a total level, when we uploaded those three assets, what we're looking at here on the left in the white is the brand score. So that's how those 300 odd people felt about the brand and then how they felt across all of the different assets. And it's the combined score across all of those drivers. What is this telling us, Daniel? Well, it's telling us that those partnerships are not working for the brand as well as they would want it to. Um, like I said, the meaningful difference uh, criteria we have is a five point score. And we can see that... Um, the two high profile partnerships and Michael Sarah and Marcus Rashford are actually meaningfully pulling the brand baseline down. Um, the only partnership that really seems to be kind of maintaining the brand's current equity would be that Dr. Fab partnership. So interesting. <laughs> and she's the dermatologist. So she has the most credible reason for, for the partnership working. I'm really surprised by Marcus Rashford. Um, we were looking at different segments as well, and, and it's fair to, to keep that going. So again, with everything that we do, whether it's measuring the brand or, or measuring assets, you can also segment across those different users. We're looking at users here again. So unfortunately, the picture gets a little less positive when we look at users, because now that Dr. Fab partnership isn't quite meeting um, that strong user baseline that um, CeraVe has. So these partnerships on their own aren't necessarily going to boost the brand's equity, mm. but it'd be interesting to find out what's underneath that pro quo score, what's happening at the driver level. Yeah, right. So there must be some positivity coming through. So again, with everything we measure, we can break that down. We're looking at the Skittles chart, but now for the asset tests themselves, again, with the brand baseline across the middle and either whether the asset is improved or, or hasn't improved that. And yeah, it's not looking good. No, unfortunately, it doesn't get much rosier. Uh, you can see, though, where that Dr. Fab partnership is working for the brand. It's boosting its integrity, which makes a lot of sense, given that she is a clinical dermatologist. She is that expert um, that CeraVe has kind of associated themselves with uh, over a long period of time. 
but also clarity is really clear. Um, so that clarity is all about, you know, do I understand like why I would use this product? What's its purpose? Um, and, you know, she does a really good job of explaining how to use a particular product, what needs um, to do that for. So yeah, you can see, okay, we're, we're starting to like elevate that brand baseline and contribute to um, the overall brand's experience of integrity, clarity, innovation, and attraction. But unfortunately, neither Mark, Michael Sarah or Marcus Rashford are lifting the brand uh, above its baseline, with the exception of Marcus Rashford gets a little bit of a, a point for attraction. <laughs> but... very, very attractive going, makes sense. <laughs> um, we... We weren't really, we weren't massively whelmed by the results here. So no. we thought we'd better test some more stuff, right? We we thought we couldn't leave it with just those three. So we actually did a bit more testing. So what did we decide to go with? Yeah, so CeraVe has, you know, been building its own Fluent device uh, for a long time. You know, they have leveraged that expert image with the white coats, the dermatologists, They've really built their brand around being recommended by dermatologists and, you know, um, yeah, having that expertise and knowing um, proper skin care, delivering benefits. So we wanted to test a few of those assets as well. Um, so we pulled a brand story from their IG, which was largely um, the main message was largely, you know, that the all their products are developed uh, by dermatologists. Then there was a bit of a collab between Emma Chamberlain, who is um, quite a influential influencer with 15.2 million uh, IG followers. But the collab was between her and that white coat fluent device that um, Sarah Bay uses um, with the uh, message to kind of like share your results. Um, you know, the proof is in the results. So that was uh, the goal there. And then we took a six second advert that was literally just a dermatologist in a white coat with uh, a, it was like a carousel of products that um, coincided with different type of skin type uh, needs. So like a product would show up and it would uh, display what skin type that was for. So these are all kind of like evergreen brand um collateral and we wanted to see how that performed relative to the partnerships to see what's happening with the brand all right well we, we've run it through the same system so once again on the left in the white is the brand score so from the people that came through to this test that's how they feel about the brand and then we've got the assets going through this is a little bit more positive yeah and surprising i'm not gonna lie i really did not think a six second ad <laughs> <laughs> was going to outperform all of that incredible creative um, that we've just kind of come across. So yeah, that six second uh, cleanse like a derm ad um, meaningfully lifts the brand's baseline. And we see that the brand story, even though it kind of seemed a little corporate and a little dry, also lifted the brand baseline. But again, that influencer collab with the the white coat dermatologists, it didn't lift the brand baseline. Like yeah. it's very interesting that these high profile, large reaching uh, partners are just not elevating the brand the way you would expect it to. What, what does the six second ad tell us about our attention spans? I mean, <laughs> all right. But the, the purpose of this, again, the same narrative is we're looking at the, the users. We're, we're talking about, um, you know, the retention of your existing users. Are you are you holding on to people on that loyalty? So, again, um, yeah, pretty similar, similar results. Yeah. yeah, it just gets a little bit more exaggerated for that six second spot. Um, but it shows what's working. OK, let's look at this broken down across the, the Skittles chart again. So that's the overall score. Here's those metrics laid out. And yeah, the, the green asset has has killed it on some of these. Yeah, relevance really stands out. Um, innovation and empathy. But I think relevance and empathy are really interesting here. Um, we go into it shortly, but I think that's where the six second ad really meaningfully outperforms the other assets. This is where it's really shining, where the other um, executions are just not quite achieving the same level. So mm -hmm. relevance is all about uh, whether or not you feel like uh, a brand or a product is marketed for you. Is it for me? 
uh, does it is it relevant to my needs? And empathy is all about does uh, this brand really understand what I need in order to deliver it? And there's some sort of like emotional trust that's built through that. Yeah. Well, it hasn't looked good for the celebrity partnerships. Let's sort of summarize it <laughs> here now. Yeah. When you check out that leaderboard, it's like, honestly, when we first set out to build this, um, I definitely did not think this was going to be the story. <laughs> um, that six second cleanse like a derm ad is really the standout winner uh, against all the other executions. Um, and sadly, the really high profile executions are the ones that did the poorest when it comes to lifting the brand's equity. Yeah, so they're, they're high profile people like them, but there's a misalignment there. They're not doing what that brand needs them to do. Um, we, we started, um, we, we've shown you all system one data so far. That's people's feelings, but we also gather how they think and, and say and react to the brand. So we also have some of that to talk about. Yeah, so, you know, because we have the system one, system two, we really like to connect those dots. And while the system one kind of gives us that like instinctual and like automatic response, um, that's super informative to how people are going to behave when they're out shopping, that the system two helps us kind of diagnose why they're feeling what they're feeling or the strength of what they're feeling. And, and as I called out, relevance and empathy are really those two areas where that cleanse like a derm, that's the magic for this ad. People really appreciate the simplicity of the ad, that they're not being oversold and they're getting just the right amount of information on the product. So there's a level of um, credibility with uh, the expert and you know there's not too much messaging, too much flash. It's really, here's a product, here's what it's for, here's what it does. And users in particular really appreciate that. And um, because the ad featured multiple different products addressing multiple uh, skin type needs, um, people could really kind of see themselves, uh, you know, shopping for CeraVe. They, the um, representation of uh, the vast variety of, of skincare needs is, is really what helped um, this ad perform so well. Brilliant. And and then we obviously have the sort of the negatives. And what, mm. what was it that didn't that didn't yeah. work for the others then? I know it's interesting. And like there isn't a top line message. Each partnership kind of had its own shortcomings. The Emma Chamberlain ad um kind of evoked a bit of um, I guess, Instagram anxiety, you know, having to always put on a very polished um facade so to speak that can be a bit exhausting they felt that that ad kind of contributed to that negative experience whereas dr fab she uh while she's great and has tons of credibility and a great audience it felt very generic it felt like a lot of other skincare ads we know that in the beauty category influencers are a huge um channel uh, of marketing for brands and it feels a bit templated at this stage and it did not feel uh, unique to CeraVe or memorable in that respect. For Michael Sarah and Marcus Rashford though, while people enjoyed uh, the content, they enjoyed the celebrity, uh, they did not feel that it did the product any justice. They really wanted to know more about the product and feel less like they were being sold something. Um, it definitely comes across as though our UK uh, consumer is um, is pretty skeptical when it comes to uh, when they're being advertised to. They want it to be a bit more brass tacks and uh, about the product and less about the flash and the panache. A bit more than just skin deep. <laughs> oh, don't laugh at that. All right. So this was the most interesting thing for me is how the different audiences viewed the ads. Oh, so this yep. is stark. Isn't it? Yeah. We tested this ad in the US as well. And, you know, <laughs> it it's kind of night and day. Like the Michael Sarah ad simply did not help um, move the brand forward when it comes to its user base. But in the US, it 
is off the charts on differentiation. And that was one of those drivers where um, the brand was kind of falling behind the competitive set. So in America, the Michael Sarah partnership is ticking a few boxes. It is elevating that popularity. It's elevating differentiation. Um, it is elevating the brand. But in the UK, it is just not hitting the mark. And it's so interesting to see this as stark as starkly as as it is on screen, how different the markets are that when you're marketing to one population over another population, um, you really have to kind of dial into those market level nuances so that you are connecting with people meaningfully in order to achieve your goals. Yeah, and we work with a lot of international brands that will, will try to use the same brand assets in multiple markets. And, and, and this is telling us that that simply isn't going to be effective even when you've got an ad that works in both languages in, in the same language across two markets yeah all right but there was some positive yeah i found it really interesting that while the michael sarah ad in the uk really did not perform well on a system one um measurement but when you go into those system two responses it tells a very different story so if we were to have just um you know made a decision based on those open-ended responses, we may have made a very different decision because it's so glowing. People genuinely really liked the ad. It came out in the language that they use. They were very um, descriptive, effusive. They used words like surprised, funny. Um, you know, those are great words that you want uh, associated with your advert because funny makes it more memorable, right? You're going to remember this ad. It was clever. It was witty. Uh, it was surprising. And so it's going to stick in your brain a little bit better. Uh, but <laughs> for some reason, people, when we asked them how they felt about the brand after seeing this advert, it just didn't move the needle, unfortunately. Yeah, and so what we're seeing here is a sort of traditional survey-based approach where you ask people to tell you how they feel. You you may get overwhelmingly positive feedback, but when you're actually measuring their feelings and that's the, the data that correlates with how they're going to act and, and even purchase behavior, it tells a different story. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so um, <laughs> you have to answer the question, Danielle. I know. <laughs> tell them about celebrity partnerships. Are they worth it? Are they a game changer or a gimmick? Uh, I don't think they're a game changer. Um, <laughs> they, but uh, we did see that, um, particularly the Michael Sarah ad, while it didn't build their equity, it definitely boosted their memorability and helped to build that top of funnel. Um, so they are going to be more memorable. They're going to be more top of mind. Um, and, you know, that is the goal of, of every marketer is to make sure that your brand is front of mind when a consumer is considering your category. Yeah. It also lifted the equity in America, but not in the UK. So that just goes to show that, you know, we need a market level strategy uh, for a global brand. Um, it can work, but you just need to flex it accordingly. What it didn't do was address that strategic priority that we mapped out in the beginning. And that was, while CeraVe is the market leader, it is showing some vulnerability and some weakness with its users. So you would anticipate that any marketing activation would attempt to try to build the equity with their users to help improve their competitiveness and their position in the market. And unfortunately, those partnerships just did not uh, achieve that strategic priority. And that largely comes down to the fact that the partnerships did not support product education enough. It was too much about the celebrities. It was too much about, um, you know, the fanfare uh, and the entertainment and not enough about here's what the product is, here's what the product does, and here's why you need it. And people really want that, particularly users, right? They're already bought into your brand. They want to know, you know, they, they need more evidence and more reasons to keep coming back. So really solidify that decision for them. So it's not a slam dunk. It is not necessarily a game changer, but it has proven to be an effective ingredient to a broader strategy. And so it is just one um, one element in a much bigger plan, but used correctly. Um, what we've seen is, you know, 
there'll, there'll always be celebrity partnerships. But what's important to understand is where are the strengths and weaknesses of your brand? Where where do you see an opportunity or an area that you should improve on? And then making sure that that partnership or how you implement that partnership complements the things and the strategy that you need to do. So simply grabbing someone famous like Marcus Rashford and sticking them in an advert isn't going to have the impact unless you've aligned it to the actual needs of your, your category and your brand and, and so on. Um, and we've seen this across a lot of different partnerships. So we actually tested loads here. Um, is there any, any sort of top line headlines for these? Um, I think I think if you're if you're curious about um, the intricacies and the magic of celebrity partnerships, it's definitely worth reading um, because we kind of covered the whole gambit with uh, a celebrity like Sydney Sweeney, who is uh, partnering with many brands all at the same time and often in the same category. So, what is the you know impact of that? when you're working with a celebrity that's working with many brands. And then we also have um, celebrity backed brands and the impact of a celebrity backed brand with um, Fenty Beauty and Rihanna, which is an excellent example. And then we wanted to test, um, yeah, another partnership that was largely American to see how that worked because this does feel like to be a bit more of a, a US phenomenon with the, the celebrities. And it's a very different story over there. <laughs> um so yeah surely, exactly. surely ben affleck has had a good impact on dunkin donuts but if people want to find out they're going to have to download the guide and have a read through they're going to have to read it yes all right well thank you danielle for for your analysis and thanks for putting your, your work into helping us understand um, how celebrity partnerships look and and the best way to sort of measure them and, and see if they have an impact on the brand for the people um, that are watching the recording um, you've already got the guide by this point so i hope you enjoy that um, for everyone that's tuned in live to the webinar, stick around. We're going to do a Q and A now. Um, so let's see if there's any questions that have come through. It looks like we've got two questions. Yeah. So how quickly can you test a campaign? Um, so asset test. I probably should have said that at the start. Um, and asset test takes around twenty four hours. So very rapid, typically a day to get the results back from um, a test. And when it comes to a campaign, it, it really depends on um, what your objectives are. If you'd like to sort of understand the overall impact of a campaign, we would suggest or recommend getting probably about a month's worth of baseline data, have that then um, continue tracking through the duration of the campaign aligned with that asset test, and then maybe a month after the campaign finishes. So you understand where your brand is at. Um, you've tested the assets, you know how the, the metric should move during the campaign, and then you can see if that falls off or, or has the or maintains its strength after the campaign has finished. Um, and the next question was, is it possible to test the same asset in multiple markets? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're global. Um, you can test in as many markets as you want. So yeah, absolutely. We can do that for you as well. I think that is all of the questions that have come through. So thank you very much to everyone that attended. Um, if you do have any other questions, you can connect with us after this and we'll happily, um, happily answer those for you. Or if you'd like to have a, a full look at the system, you can drop us a line and we'll book a demo in and I'll, I'll take you on a guided tour through some other sort of brand data and answer all of your questions live. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, John. Bye. Thank you.